Good morning. Well, I am excited that we get to open up a new series, and much like our last series, that uh, was kind of a, a yearly sort of, in one form or another, here's who we are, here's where we're going. Uh, we want to remind you so we don't forget. This series is also a reminder, and I think it's an, an especially important reminder considering the culture that we live in here in America. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, being rooted in the Word of God as it pertains to our finances, our resources for the next couple of weeks. And, and in, the, in the future weeks, we're going to get into what does the Bible actually say specifically. But this week, what I want to do is I, I just want to um, ask you some questions. And as we go through Scripture, I, I'm hoping you'll be evaluating and reflecting on your life, and are you ready? Are you ready? And uh, we'll explain what that means a little bit more. You know, as a, as a uh, disciple maker, as disciples, we are learning to follow Jesus, we're being changed by Jesus, we're committed to the mission of Jesus. When we make disciples, remember we were told to go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey all that is commanded. When you give your life to Jesus, you, you've been saved, uh, not just from uh, hell, the cost of sin, and we've all sinned and fallen short, but you've been saved from your own um, perspective, your own sinful nature, from the world's perspective that when you listen to what the world has to say and you live according to its way of doing things, it leads to emptiness. Uh, when a person isn't a believer, they're often like, saved from what? What do I need to be saved from? I'm as good as this person or that person. Or, and, and again, the Bible puts us all on um, equal footing. Scripturally speaking, we have all fallen short of the glory of God because we've all rebelled against God. And we're all in this process of either uh, living out that lostness and that brokenness and letting it take, go wherever uh, it leads and eventually to death, the Bible says, and eternal uh, hell. But, but we've come to this place where like, okay, Lord, I, I, I don't want to live out those consequences. I don't want to keep making a mess of my life. I don't want to destroy my life or anybody else's life. I want, I want to be different. And so when we say yes to the Lord, we start this process of choosing to understand his perspective, allowing him to teach us the truth about reality. And so it, it, that reveals your repentance. You know, it's not just believing that God is, 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 exists or that Jesus is the son of God. It's a spirit of repentance in us that says we no longer want to lean on our own understanding, do things our own way. In all our ways, Proverbs 3, 5, we want to acknowledge you, and we want to be obedient to you. You know, I was uh, thinking about this, and as a Christian, we want to place our trust in God, not just for salvation, but for living. I want you to, I want you to turn over with me to a passage of scripture. It's, it's in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And this is the mind of a person who is repentant. Meaning, this is the mind of a person who is, has decided to follow Jesus. And so let me read this to you. It says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way, of the, uh, 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 in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditate on his uh, law day and night. Blessed is the man who doesn't uh, live like the rest of the world, um, chasing the way of sin, pursuing the way of our, our own sinful natures and, and what the world values. Blessed is the man who doesn't sit and walk and stand in all of that. But our delight is in the law of God. Our delight is in the law. In other words, I want his will because his will is always for my good. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, that when God says something, he's right, because he, he created the world, he knows how it exists, he knows how you exist, he knows, uh, he knows what makes you you, he, he sees eternity, he knows how even one decision can uh, lead you 
into a mess. I was just thinking about this, this hit me. This last week I went hunting and we got off the trail and I was following a guy uh, and we walked out, I had wool clothes on, you know, wool clothes, and I walked into Cockleburs. And I looked down and you couldn't see my pants. It was like five minutes of following this guy. And I looked down and I went, you know what, you're the devil. It's like five minutes off the trail and I'm covered in stuff and it took me the rest of the day to pick all those things out. Isn't that kind of like what sin is? You give in for five minutes and it can take you five years of cleaning that up. I'm still picking that stuff out. And uh, we've come to this place where like, no, I want God's word. I want it. And when I don't want it, I want to want it, right? I know I'm wrong when I don't want it, and I want to want it. I want to, be, to do what he's asked me to do because he's right and he's good and he cares about me. He goes on, listen to what he says here. This person who delights in the law of God and meditates on it day and night, verse three, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so with the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. In other words, uh, they won't be able to stand there forgiven, covered by Christ. They, they can't stand. The judgment will fall upon them. Uh, and he says, uh, so therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Have you, have you come to that place where you want to be rooted next to the living water? This is an important subject because right now, in scripture, we're warned over and over again not to get enamored with the things of this world. Not to get enamored with um, uh, the, the money, the things that, that you can buy pleasure with. Uh, it, the money that you could buy so-called security with. Not to get hung up on, on planet Earth, seeing it the way the rest of the world sees it. To not trust in your riches, not trust in your, uh, Bible talks about uh, uh, some trust in horses and chariots, in other words, military might, but we trust in the Lord our God. It's, it's this concept of I'm gonna trust him instead of all these other things. Let me give you some warnings that Jesus talks about this, and if you go into Luke, and uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter six nineteen says this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he's saying, hey, what, whatever you treasure the most, that's where your heart, that's what you're gonna be thinking about, that's what you're gonna be contemplating, working at. He's like, hey, don't trust in these things that don't last, where, where, where they rot, where they're unstable. You know, have you come to the place where you've come to realize that if you spend your life spend, uh, making money so that you can buy pleasure, number one uh, priority for unbelievers right now, 50% of Americans believe their number one pursuit should be their own personal happiness, and therefore, most important thing is money, according to new polls. Money and their own happiness. So they believe that money can buy them happiness. Others uh, believe that money can buy them security. Um, that if I have enough money, if times get bad, I'll have, I'll have the money to be able to handle whatever's going on. But are you guys, you all are aware by this point that, that because of the computer systems we have, electronics, all those things, you can have money one day in your account and it can be gone the next. You are aware of that, right? You, you are aware that security, uh, if you're relying on human ways of doing that, uh, when you rely on something unstable, you're unstable. You're in a predicament. The word of God here makes it, he's, listen, he says, don't trust in those things. And then he says, you cannot serve both God and money. Some are like, okay, I won't serve uh, fully God and I won't serve fully money. I'll kind of do it in the middle and be kind of have one foot on both sides of the fence. And, and Jesus made it clear, you cannot do it. 
Now he's saying that from uh, two perspectives. First, you can't actually do it. You can't have one foot on one side and one foot on the other. You'll have it on one side or the other. But secondly, even if you could, God would not accept it. In fact, he, he, Jesus says, I wish that you were hot, all in or cold, not in at all, but because you were lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. He's like, no, I, that, you can't do it. Um, let me give you this passage. This is 1 Timothy chapter six. It's a great chapter. And it's Paul warning um, uh, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, pretty wealthy cultures about their financial status. Uh, he's dealing with some rich people. He's got poor people, he's got rich people. And in this case, he's warning them in 1 Timothy 6, he starts out warning them about false teachers who are coming. And so he says this, he says, uh, verse four, I'll start there. Uh, I'd even back up further because of time, I'm gonna start in verse four. He says, they are conceited and understand nothing, these false teachers. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth. Now notice what one of the characteristics of someone who has been robbed of the truth. Listen to this about this false teacher. And who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. You know what he's talking about? We call it the prosperity gospel. That's where uh, you've got these uh, preachers out there that'll tell you that you need to trust in God and the way that you trust in God is if you tithe or you give money to their ministry that if you're godly in some way, doing the right thing, it's actually a means to financial gain. Now, let me tell you, it's true that if you do the wise thing and you're walking with God, God's gonna take, take care of your needs, that's true. Although, have you noticed that God's idea of your need and your idea of your need are often different? Have you guys noticed that? He says he'll take care of, he says, ask him for what you need. But this says, no, no, don't ask us for ask for what you need. What do you want? If you do this, if you sow seed in this ministry, you're gonna get wealthy, you're gonna have a breakthrough, you're gonna get more of what the world tells you you need. So it's actually a way of bribing God. If you do this, you're not doing it because of what he's already done for you. Because of who he is, you're doing it because you want more stuff and God knows your heart. If you tip him off, if you, I'm tipping you so you'll give me more. He's like, no, that does, this is actually what ungodly teachers teach. That's what he's doing here. He's reprimanding these people. Now he goes on, he says this. Uh, He says, uh, um, but godliness with contentment, verse six, is great gain. Godliness with contentment, not more of what you want. No, choosing to be content with what you have. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds. It is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is different than using money as a tool. If, if you love money, if that's where your treasure is, it's gonna buy you your happiness, it's gonna buy you your security, your defenses, your, 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 you know, if you love that, it leads to your destruction. He says this, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. He goes on, listen to what it says in verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Notice verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, you will lay up treasure for yourselves as a firm foundation of the coming age so that you may take hold of the life that is truly life. So he's saying, listen, 
Uh, remember how in, in, we were saying in Matthew 6, he says, don't store up treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasure in heaven. What, what is the key to storing up treasure in heaven here? It says being generous, do, be, being rich in good works and generous, and in so doing, you lay up for yourself treasure as a firm foundation. Notice Jesus and, and the, the writings of scripture are about putting your trust in God and living for eternity. Living for things that are far beyond what we can see. And isn't that the battle? Faith is to, to say, what I'm really seeing here isn't all there is. It's not just right now, it's not just what I see, it's trusting God for eternity, it's valuing what he says I should value, it's placing my trust in him and his word. Now as you walk through the passages, you have this constant warning. Be careful what you trust. Be careful who you trust. If you get it wrong, you pay a price, and God gives you the ability to choose. I love this, guys. You do, you do know that, that the scriptures are kind of like the, op, it's like an open book test, right? God says, listen, you're going to have a test, and it's going to be on what's in this book and your relationship with me. He tells us in advance, and then he says, but when the test comes, you, 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 just, you, you don't get to know the exact time and date. It's either you're going to die and you're going to come to be with me or I'm going to return. You just need to be ready for the test. And he says very clearly, this is what I want you to do. I want you to trust me. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Uh, the book of Psalms, David is writing there and you see that. But uh, after David goes to the Lord, dies and goes to be with the Lord, other kings come, and now prophets start to come and say, Israel, what are you doing? You're not trusting God. You're not being obedient. And God sends prophet after prophet after prophet. And finally, he sends Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the last prophet before Israel is destroyed for a period of time. And Jeremiah wrote the book, Jeremiah and the book Lamentations, to lament, to cry. It, 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 the sad thing for Jeremiah is he wasn't kind of like Isaiah. In Isaiah, uh, he prophesied about what was going to happen in, in years, many, many years into the future, 750 years into the future and beyond that. Jeremiah had to prophesy what was going to happen in the next few years, and they wouldn't listen to him. And then Jeremiah got to live through the consequences of their rejection. But here's what Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Now I want you to notice he's doing a contrast. He's saying if you trust in man, you've actually turned away from God. If you've trusted in man, you've turned away from God. Now what does he mean by trusting in man? Trusting in human wisdom. Trusting in people instead of trusting in what God has said. Trusting in your own wisdom based on your own experience apart from God's will. Trusting a, a financer, a financial planner who, who thinks only in terms of uh, uh, human uh, existence without bringing God into the equation. Trusting in a counselor a psychologist or somebody who's rejected God. It's always amazing to me that you wanna be okay in the mind, but you reject the one who made the mind and use only human sorts of understandings rather than coupling that with, with God's word. There are certainly medical things we can learn, but uh, listen, you really wanna understand the mind and the heart and the soul. You gotta have somebody who is, yes, medically uh, capable in understanding how God made us, but you gotta have the God who made us involved. It's the same. I, I still remember this years ago. We were sitting with a financial counselor who wasn't a believer, and my wife and I, and, and he's saying, okay, here's what you got to do. You got to have 10% 10, 10 in saving and 10% investing, and then you live and you live in this budget. And I go, well, okay, we got to work on the savings part. We didn't have the savings at that point, but we're investing. He said, really? What are you investing in? Stocks, options? I said, no, we tithe. He said, that's not invest. What's that in investing? What do you mean in tithing? What did, yep, 
We, we just believe that we're investing in the kingdom of heaven and God has given promises that he'll take care of us through thick, thick and thin. It won't always be what we want, but we, we, we're investing in something greater. We're, and he's like, oh, that's ridiculous. You're fired. <laughs> Understanding, notice what he says. He says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands, they, in the deserts. They will, they will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert. It's so interesting. When you don't trust in the Lord and, and you even have prosperity, they don't see it. You know what that means? I mean, think about it. We, we in America are the richest country in the world and we have the highest suicide rate. They're prosperous, they've got stuff, but they don't see it. They can't see what they have. When you trust, you're like, you're like well, don't, you know, you've got your health, well, you know, that, that doesn't matter. You've got, you've got a house, yeah, I don't care about the house. Okay, so you're, God is blessing, but you won't see it because you don't place your trust in him and your eyes now are deluded. You, you, you now can't see what God is even doing. You, you have no joy in your life. You've got everything the world says you need to be happy and yet Americans are the most addicted. Why? Well, coping. What, why do they need to cope? What do they need to go? Many of them are rich kids, rich people who have plenty, who are educated. What's the problem? Money doesn't save you. It can't save you. It doesn't fill the hole that only God can fill. As he goes through, they'll be, he notices they'll be like, a, he says, a, they will dwell in parched places of the desert in salt land where no one lives. They'll be lonely, stunted, never what they could have been, unhappy. But he says this, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, not in the economy. And so it can, I can trust the economy because it will never go bad. I can trust this job. I can trust, uh, no, listen, whose confidence is in the Lord. No matter what happens, if he is with me, then who can be against me? He goes on, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. It has no worry in the time of drought. Notice it didn't say that there was no drought. You see, we live in a cursed world. We live in a world that is winding down. Until Jesus returns, God is with us, but there's the ups and the downs that come from life. If you remember the Psalm 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me. He says, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that word's not, yea, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, yes, even though I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. As you start to unpack this, he says, there's one who is in a wasteland, stunted growth, alone. The other who trusts in the Lord, who's confidence in him, they'll be like a tree planted by water. It produces fruit. I, I see this, I, we have several folks right now that are fighting cancer, terminal cancer. And their, their walk with the Lord was strong before, you know, they're rooted. And now, now here comes this terminal cancer. And again, we'll start praying and God may heal. I've seen him do that many, many times. But they're just walking around and you're like, how are you doing? And you, and you're, and you, you even you're like, you're, you put on what they must be thinking. And you're like, man, are, are you okay? And they're like, oh, well, I'm great. Things are good. You're great. Things are good. Tell me about that. Are you, are you in denial or have you lost your... Your cookies? What's going on? No, man. I mean, it's just nice to know that God walks with me. There's a peace that passes all understanding. There's a, there's a joy. And yeah, I mean, the pain stinks, but, and you're just watching them like a tree planted, rooted in water, and you come away encouraged and kind of asking yourself, man, I don't have half what they got going on, and I whine a lot. 
There's, when you're trusting in the Lord for strength to go through a situation, through the finances to supply what's needed, through the protection, and even if, if the world does its best, the most important person is the one who created the universe and he stands with me, not something he created, like money or, no, I'm, I'm with the one who created it all and if he created it once, he can create it again, can't he? For me, for you. They're rooted, they're trusting. Now what does it actually look like to trust? Right, let me show you another passage. I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter six with me, Luke chapter six. This is Jesus, and we've, we've talked about this often. Jesus uh, tells this parable in a variety of different ways. He tells it in Matthew different than he tells it in Luke. In Luke, and all that does is tell you that Jesus uh, spoke the parable many times, not just once, many times. Why? People forget. And so he would use it in a different way. And this is a reoccurring lesson he would teach his guys. Listen to this. Verse 46, Luke 6, 46. He says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Okay, stop right there. Um, remember, Jesus was with the Father in eternity in heaven. Now he's come down, and he's got people following him around and saying, Lord, and Lord, and some people see the miracles, and, they, and, and, and when he was with the Father in heaven, before he came down and took on flesh, he'd heard a lot of people going, oh Lord this, and oh Lord that. In Isaiah, you hear the prophet saying, why do people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me? Jesus quoted that. And so here's, here's what he's saying, why do, you call, why do you say I'm your Lord, but you don't do what I say? But it, clearly I'm not your Lord if you don't do what I say. That's what he's really saying. He goes on. As for everyone who, I want you to see this, we're about to understand what it looks like to put your trust in God. He's about to tell us. He says, don't, don't just say you trust me when you don't. Now he's gonna tell you what it is to trust God. Listen to this. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, Everyone who comes to me, hears my words and puts them into practice. I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation of, on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house. Notice, did it say if the flood came or when the flood came? When the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its des destruction was complete. When you're talking about being rooted or you're talking about having a foundation, what we're really saying is this. You've placed your trust in God as the one who saves us, but also gives us um, the right actions, the right principles, the right way of living that will help us withstand on planet Earth the coming storms, the coming issues, cultural, political, relational. And he's saying, listen, some trust in human beings' way of doing things, marriage. I'm gonna trust in um, some counselor that doesn't know Christ, isn't bringing God into the picture, and uh, has got some cool philosophy of if you find the right soulmate, and then marriage will be easy, and if you follow these principles, then you'll get everything you were supposed to get. Um, and, you know, no, listen, to trust in God goes, God, what did you say marriage is? 
What have you given me, the Holy Spirit? What have you, what have you want me to do? And, and what do you want me to do even if somebody else doesn't do their part? You've asked me to do this. I'm going to do this. You're my Lord. I'm doing what I'm doing not to get, though I know full well that if I do your will, it will eliminate a lot of problems. But even if it doesn't turn out the way I want it to, I'm putting my trust in you because if I'm with you, it doesn't matter what happens. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When Paul was in jail, that's when he wrote that in Philippians. He's in jail and he says, hey, listen, I have found the secret of contentment. I know what it is to have plenty and I know what it is to be in need. I found the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can be content because whatever happens with Christ's strength in his presence, I can be rooted when the storm comes. I can stand it. And when the storm is over, ultimately on my death or Jesus' return, I know where I'm going. I know there's a crown waiting for me. I know that there's a new body. I know that the world will be as it should. I will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Whatever happens down here, this world is not my home. I'm in it. I'm not of it. I'm going to trust in a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Now, Here's why I'm saying all this. When you look at the stats, even for the church, you, you heard me uh, say that the national stats that are coming out through Pew Research and Barna and all those, that uh, uh, you know, between 40 and 50% of Americans think their own personal happiness is the highest thing to live for, and so that money is super important. And uh, you know, so that's what they're achieving. And then, then you look at the stats for Christians and. And uh, there's a, next week we'll be talking about what does the Bible actually say about uh, how we are to live and, and what does it look like to be obedient with our finances and, and live uh, with the Lord on that and trust in him. But uh, here's what they're saying. Less than 3% of American Christians are biblically generous, meaning they obey God when it comes to money, less than 3%. Now I want you to think about that. that that's Christians, by the way. If placing your trust in God and being obedient, hearing his word and doing what he says, that's what trusting in God is. And Christians either don't know, don't care to know, or aren't living out that trust in their life. It means their houses, their lives are built with no foundation. Now, here's why I care about this. Have you guys noticed the world's kind of going crazy? See, I'm a history guy, so um, even it was fascinating to hear when Jesus comes on the scene, um, did you know that most of Israel at that time was looking for a Messiah? See, the signs of the times, everything that had happened as they had read the Old Testament, they were like, the Messiah is coming. He's coming soon. Who is he? They were all looking for him. Because when you looked at the prophecy and you looked at world events, they were going, he's coming, he's coming soon. Now, when Jesus, the way they they didn't understand scripture well enough to know that Jesus had to go to the cross before he became the, uh, the, the warrior, he had to die as the lamb before he came as the lion. They didn't understand that. So because he didn't come on a white stallion, they rejected him. And that was all part of the plan too. But the signs of the times were pretty evident that something was happening. That's why Jesus said, you know, the farmers or the sailors, they're talking about in the red sky in the morning, sailors take warning, red sky at night, sailors delight. You you look at the signs of the times and you do that, but you're not seeing the signs of the times. Jesus actually criticized the religious leaders of the day because they were missing it. When, when, Israel was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. If you go back and you read what's going on, the Jews are going, hey, um, God is going to come and save us. But they had rejected the king and Jesus actually foresaw and prophesied that Jerusalem would befall. And and, and, and the Jews didn't quite figure it out. And and, and they thought, well, surely he's going to come because it's getting really bad. And he didn't come. He was just removing Israel for a period of time. 
Later on, when a lot of Rome becomes Christian, when Rome starts falling by the barbarians, you may not know this, but a lot of the writing was, this must be the end, Jesus is coming, and, and uh, uh, he's coming to return, but no, that wasn't really what was going on. Rome became so corrupt from the inside out that it fell apart. They were right in that God was judging Rome for what it had done and what it had become. But they were wrong about Jesus' return. And many people weren't ready for the political and the social stuff that happened when Rome fell. They were so used to Rome being in charge for so long. When it fell apart, it, 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 it was such a people. It was hard for people and many people weren't ready. Throughout the centuries, countries have come and gone. Uh, they played uh, uh, their, their part for a time. The book of Acts says that God chooses what times we're in and when we'll be there and, and you have a slice of history you play in. And so I'm looking at this country right now and what I'm seeing is this. Unless there's a major revival, I think, Christian, or I think America is toast. I think it's toast. We're so divided, we don't, we, a house divided against itself can't stand. We can't agree on anything. It, 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 it's probably not since the Civil War has it been, like, it been this bad in America. I'm looking at this country, how ungodly it is, how we promote things. I mean, now elections, people know full well about abortion and, 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 and that these people want to ha have abortion all the way up to birth in some states and they don't care. We want abortion. Pl very clear. It used to be, well, we, we only want abortion up to the... No, once you start that game, it's very clear what they want. And yet, they, people still vote for them. When you look at this country, America, Billy Graham said this about America years ago. He said, God is going to have to do something about America pretty quick or apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Well, because we're the source of most porn. The transgender movement starts with a bunch of rich people who have rejected God, who are coming up with ways to think about things, and they're spreading it all over the globe. It's coming from here. There are godly people in America, but this country, when you look at it, the divisions, it's clearly going down. But then you add things like what's going on in Israel right now. There are reasons to believe that it may not just be the turnover of another country, it may be we're close. We're close. I don't know of anything else that has to happen before the rapture. I don't. I'm hoping for the pre-tribulational rapture. If that's, then I'm hoping for the mid, and then if we're stuck with the post, we'll live through it. One way or another, it's a storm we're facing. Here's why I say all this. Are you ready? If it's just a storm and America's going down, if your trust is not in God, if you haven't decided to use your time, energy, and effort in a way that creates a firm foundation for your life, if you've been too busy to be in relationship with other believers, if, if you haven't fed your faith, so that it can withstand hard times? If you haven't placed your money and been obedient with, to the Lord with what you have, and this just, it's just the country going down, the economy going down, everything that we see coming, uh, uh, you know, you can see it coming. If you can't see it coming, there's something wrong. Listen, if you're not rooted and you're not ready because you're not trusting God, Well, honestly, I hope he completely takes down your life for the purpose of your salvation. Maybe that's what it's gonna take for you to get saved. Prosperity doesn't seem to make us reach out to God. It's when we get in trouble and we've done it and we blew it and good thing he's a saving God, but are you ready for a storm of this country going in a direction that is completely godless and God takes his hand off of it and it goes that way? Are you ready? Are your kids ready? It's not just you, are your kids ready to have a relationship with God? Some Christians will even tell you, here's what we need to do. You need to prep and you need to get guns and, and toilet paper and food. And, and so let's, get, let's have classes on prepping. And I am like, okay, I, I have some extra food too. But I, the truth is, if I have extra food and my neighbor doesn't, and I say, no, you can't have my food and here's a gun, am I really following Jesus? Is that, is that really what he would do? 
I want you to prep, but I want you to prep by having a relationship with God. And if you do share, have food, I hope, hope you have enough to share it with people so they go, why are you sharing food? Well, because Jesus loves you and wants to save you. Right now, more than ever, you need to be alert and awake. Look at the signs of the times. Look at what's happening. If you've been distracted, it's time to stop it and get rooted. If you've not given your life to Jesus, it's time. Quit putting it off. I don't know how much time you have, but you're going to need Jesus. He's the one that will get you through not just this life, but the door to heaven is through Christ and him alone. If it is the coming, the second coming, the, the rapture and all of that, are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? I hope you are. As we walk through this series, I'm hoping that you're, you're gonna go, okay, what does the Bible actually say? I'm coming to the Lord, what does it say? What does he want me to do? And I'm gonna put that into practice. That is the safest place to be. That is trusting in God, his presence and his word, delighting in it, meditating on it day and night. There's where the source of living water comes from and the source of your stability so that you can be joyful no matter what's happening because this world isn't all there is. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for telling us what you're gonna do ahead of time. Thank you for caring about us. Thank you for all the things that you give us here that we oftentimes it's never enough for us human beings because we're just, we get sucked in. Thank you for your grace. We love you, Lord. As we take communion today, Lord, remind us of what matters most. Change us in Jesus' name, amen.